to lecture seven in a sequence of videos describing the hidden Markov model, its motivation and its representation and how we reason with it. In our last video, we talked about two different scenarios, one with a coin that was being flipped and observing from behind a curtain whether or not it was heads or tails and trying to understand whether it was a fair coin or a biased coin. We also imagined a scenario where there were lots of different jars of M&M's candy, and each one of those jars had a different color in it. Periodically, we would draw one candy from a jar at a time, and we would line them up, and those colors would become the observations. Both of these can be represented as hidden Markov models. And what I want to do in this lecture is talk about the formalism about how, we how we're going to represent hidden Markov model um, using notation. All right, so for starters, this these, these models or these games that I just described are a basic discrete hidden Markov model. It's discrete because we're, we're making observations that are uh, symbolic, like colors of M&Ms or heads or tails, as opposed to continuous numbers. So that means that a hidden Markov model has to have, in order to define our hidden Markov model, we have to recognize that it has n different states, and we need to define what those n states are. In the case of the M&Ms example, the n states are n different jars from, that, we can, that we can draw from. Which state we're currently in is hidden. Uh, as we're observing the observations coming out, we don't know which state is currently generating the observation. But typically, when we create a model using the hidden Markov model, we're modeling something that we understand about the world. For example, we know that there are jars. We just don't know necessarily which jar we're picking from or, um, yeah, we, or how we're transitioning between them. We also assume that states are generally ergodic. And by ergodic, I mean that when you are in one particular state, you are eventually going to be able to move to any other state as well. So when you think about picking from the jars, an ergodic model would mean that if I pick from jar one, I can choose from any of the jars to pick from next. Or if I can only pick from a subset of jars next, eventually I could pick from all of them by following a sequence of patterns of picking through jars. So ergodic means that all states are connected uh, eventually, are, are connected together through some path in your state diagram. So what we'll do is we'll describe our set of states as capital S, and they consist of S sub one, S sub two, all the way up till S sub N. These, state, these N states define where our hidden Markov model can actually is, but we can't actually observe it. Another thing that we want to use for notation is we want to say that at time t, the state that we're in, we represent as qt. And that means that for all i, where i is 1 to t inclusively, meaning for all time steps i, our qi, or the state that we're currently in, is going to be drawn from the set of states that we could possibly be in. So just a straightforward definition of states. First thing our hidden Markov model has to have is n states, and we have to define that. The second thing that our hidden Markov model has to have is it has to have a language that, are, that, that the observations are drawn from. There, there are m observable symbols that we're going to observe being generated by our Markov model. In the M and M's case, these M symbols are the M colors that we could possibly have. So maybe like 10 different M and M's colors. M would be equal to 10 in this case. In the case of the coin flipping example, the symbols that we observe are heads or tails. So M is equal to two in that case. It is the number of things that it is possible to observe. Um, and they are what can be observed, not the state that's generating them. These M symbols form a discrete alphabet, if you will, that can be observed. And we will represent the set of these observations as capital V, and they can be drawn from the alphabet V1, V sub 2, V sub 3, up to V sub M. And so again, V sub 1, maybe in this, di in this example, is red, and V sub 2 is orange, and V sub 3 is green, or is, uh, sorry, V sub 1 is red, V sub 2 is yellow, V sub 3 is orange, and V sub M would be white in this example. First two things a discrete Markov model needs, N states and M observable symbols. Next, a hidden Markov model has to have a state transition matrix. This state transition matrix is exactly the same as, an, as a um, 
observable Markov model. We have, we call it that state transition matrix capital A, and it consists of a number of elements A, I, J, which represent the probability of moving from state I at time t minus one to state j at time t, or the probability of being, the probability of qt, sorry, a sub ij is the probability that at time q, at time t, we observe q, we are, we are in state qt, which is equal to sj. And for all i and j, i and j must between, be between one and n, where n are all the possible states that we can be in. So it's a big two-dimensional matrix describing the probability of moving from one state to another state. Notice that the Markov, the Markov property is being invoked here. The probability of state QT being equal to SJ only depends on the observation at the previous state. It doesn't depend on many previous observations. And so in some ways, this is like a, um, uh, this is like a unigram model, if you're familiar with that language. If AIJ equals zero, that means that a transition between from state I to state J is not possible. And so if we used a state transition diagram as a representation of our transition matrix A, anywhere where there is not an arrow from I to from a state, one state to another state, would be represented by a zero in the transition probability matrix. One other constraint on our transition matrix is that the sum of all transitions from one state has to be equal to one, meaning that if we're starting in state i, the sum over all possible states that we could move to has to be equal to one, because the way a Markov model works is that on every beat, you have to move states, even if that movement is from one state to the sta same state. That's considered a movement. So I put these three jars over on the right to demonstrate that we would be moving between these different states with the state transition diagram. Now a hidden Markov model has this, um, has, this has this parameter B, which is different than the Markov model. The parameter B consists of all the probability distributions of seeing the observations given that you're in a particular state. So we say B sub J, and in parentheses K, is equal to the probability of seeing symbol VK at time T, given that we are in state SJ at time T. So we, it, it's, uh, we think about the state that we're being in, state SJ, as generating a observation VK, and it generates that observation according to some probability distribution. So J must be, be, be between one and N, because each state has its own probability distribution, and k must be, be, be between one and m, because k represents the different possible observations that we can have, or the vocabulary of observations that we can have. So if we look over on the right, we see that the jar of M&Ms has a number of different probabilities, and we can specify those as bn1, and that means what is the probability of observing symbol one given that, we're on, that we are in state n? And what is the probability of observing symbol two, given that we're in state n? Happens to be the probability of yellow. So, you know, a side effect of this is that something must be observed at every beat in a Markov model. And so the sum of the probabilities bn over all the possible subscripts one to m also has to be equal to one, because we must observe something at every state transition. Orange, green, red, 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 those represent the observations, although we don't know which state we were in that generated them, and so we can't say very much about the transition through states just from these observations. Our Markov model needs to know the number of states, it needs to know the vocabulary, it needs to know what the probability is of moving from one state to another state, and it needs to know the probability of generating a particular observation when you're in a particular state. Finally, the hidden Markov model, just like the Markov model, also has to have an initial state probability. Since what we're talking about here is a dependent, uh, is a movement through a bunch of states that depends on the previous state you're in, when you see that first observation, there was no previous state that you were in. 
And so we need a special parameter, pi, which is the probability of being in, in a particular state when you start. So prob, pi sub i is the probability that q1 equals si, meaning the probability that the state that you're in at time 1 is equal to si, where i varies between 1 and n, which are the number of states. A side effect of this, of course, is that the sum over all i of pi i must be 1, because in the Markov model we must start in some state in order to generate our observations. All right, so together that gives us the complete definition of a hidden Markov model. It can be defined by five different uh, parameters, n the number of states, m the number of symbols that we can observe, a the probability of moving from one state to another state, transition matrix, B, the probability of a particular state generating a particular symbol, the observation probabilities, and pi, the probability of starting in a, in a particular state. Those parameters can be used to generate a sequence of observations, O1, O2, O3, all the way up to OT, where each individual observation, OI, has to be drawn from the vocabulary of observations that we have, which has M elements in it. If we had this definition of the hidden Markov model, there's a particular algorithm that we could employ in order to generate the sequence of observations. We can generate observations given that we have a model already defined for us. Let's look at what that might be like. In order to generate observations, what we would do is first we would choose our starting state. Our state Q1 is equal to some state SI, and we would choose that randomly according to pi i. So if it was equally likely that we would start in any state, it doesn't have to be, but if it was, then we would just randomly choose one of the states that we're currently in. If pi i is not uniform, meaning that some states have a higher probability of starting in, well, we would have to choose randomly according to that probability distribution. But regardless of uh, which state we're starting in, we do choose a particular state we're starting in. That's not enough for the observation, though. We then set a variable t, we set that equal to 1 because we're currently in time step 1, and now we're going to choose an observation. We're going to choose an observation at time t, so O1, and that's going to be equal to one of the symbols that we have, vk, and the symbol that we're going to choose is going to be chosen according to our distribution b. So in particular, we're going to choose randomly from the symbols given that we're currently in state si. SI has its own distribution over the symbols that we're going to read, just like a jar of M&Ms has a certain distribution of colors in it. And based on the distribution of colors, based on the probability of getting a particular color in a jar, we're going to choose randomly one of those colors, and that's going to become the first observation that we generate. So, so far, behind the curtain, we've chosen a state and we've chosen an observation. On the other side of the curtain, all that, is, all that can be seen is the color of the M&M that was drawn or whether a heads or a tails was flipped. Now, for generative purposes, we need to transition to a new state. And so we're going to choose the next state that we're going to be in, QT plus one, and we're gonna choose that randomly according to our transition matrix probability. We know that we're currently in Q1, and we wanna to move to QT plus one, and so we look to see, given that we're in SI at time Q1, what's the probability of ending up in SJ? We're going to choose randomly according to all the possibilities, and we're going to bias it towards those, those states we're moving into that have a higher probability. That moves us into a new state. Now we're going to increment t, and as long as t hasn't gone higher than our maximum observation time, we'll repeat, and we'll go up and we'll choose a new observation, ot equal vk, according to the probability distribution. So we'll follow this process. We'll randomly choose to step into a new state, and then given the state we're in, we'll look up the distribution of observations, we'll pick one of those observations randomly, throw it across the curtain. Then we'll move into a new state, we'll choose an observation, throw it across the curtain. Move into a new state, choose an observation, throw it across the curtain. We'll continue doing this until we've generated the full sequence of observations that we want to generate, um, t different observations. And so in this way, we can use a hidden Markov model's parameters in order to generate a sequence of observations.
In summary, one thing that you should um, be able to observe is that an observable Markov model is just a very special case of a hidden Markov model. An observable Markov model is a Markov model in which the observation distribution has only one non-zero probability. So imagine, for example, that this is, was um, a, a coin, um, imagine this was your M&M um, jar situation. A Markov model would say that each one of our jars has only one color in it. And we're going to pick out that color and we're going to associate that color both with the observation and with the jar. So we have n different states we have the same number of observations, n equals m, and that when we're in any given state, the probability of drawing a particular observation is one for that observation that matches exactly with our jar. So for a Markov model, we would say, hey, we've got three different jars, a red jar, a green jar, and a blue jar. Those are the names of our states, red, green, and blue. Also, when we're in that state, we can only observe red, green, or blue according to that state that we're in. So a Markov model can be a special case of a hidden Markov model where our parameters are constrained in a particular way. Great. So that is our introduction to the notation and the motivation for our hidden Markov model and also how we can generate a sequence of observations given that we have a Markov model defined. Moving forward, we want to think about how might you learn the parameters of that Markov model from data that you have? Rather than generating, how can you learn the model parameters? Rather than going forward, how can you go backwards? That'll, that'll come in future um, lectures. Thank you for your attention.